responsiveness, fluid responsiveness in uh, critically ill patients. Let's start with the assessment of uh, cardiac preload. In fact, as you know, for the physiologists, the preload is determined by the end diastolic diameter, pressure, and thickness of the ventricles. This is the physiological definition of uh, cardiac preload. Nevertheless, in clinical practice, in fact, we assess either the dimensions or the pressures of the right ventricle and of the left ventricle. I mean that in the way we do that, we have not any perfect estimation of cardiac preload that corresponds to the physiological definition of this variable. With catheters, we can estimate, of course, at the right side, the central venous pressure, and at the left side, the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. We can also, with transpulmonary thermolution, like with the PICO device, assess the dimension, the global end diastolic volume, which is the volume of the four cardiac chambers at end diastole. While with echocardiography, and this is of course what we are going to speak about today, we can estimate on the right side the IVC diameter, which is an estimation of the central venous pressure, and at the left side, we can estimate the LV filling pressure with the E of the E prime ratio, and we can also assess the LV and diastolic volume. So it means that in practice, Practice for echocardiography, we have three assessments of cardiac preload. Uh, first of all, let's start with this diameter of the inferior vena cava that we usually use as an estimation of the central venous pressure. One point and one important message regarding the diameter of the IVC. It is a very poor marker of cardiac preload. It is a very poor marker of the right cardiac preload, and it's a poor estimation of the central venous pressure. It's been suspected by many studies, but now it's clearly demonstrated in that study published in, uh, the Blue, in intensive care medicine in 2018, in this French study, and a quite large number of patients. You see that there was no correlation at all between the IVC and diastolic diameter and the right atrial pressure. Or there were some correlations, but not very good at all. And especially in the patients with intra-abdominal hypertension, with intra-abdominal pressure higher than 12 millimeters of mercury, there was no correlation at all. So I know that this is a very popular way that uh, our colleagues use to estimate the right cardiac preload, looking at this diameter of the IVC, but it's not a reliable marker of the cardiac preload. And if you want to keep in mind some perhaps important messages, I think that this is the first one. The estimation of CVP through the IVC expiratory diameter is rough. Measuring CVP directly is always preferable. Now, I think that the most um, used way to estimate the uh, cardiac preload at the left side is by looking at the E over E prime ratio. How is it possible to estimate the LV filling pressure with the E over E prime ratio? To well understand that, you must um, remember the uh, different pressure traces, the pressures cycles of the heart. We have the left ventricular pressure, the aortic pressure, and the left uh, atrial pressure at the left side. And we will focus on the, this diastolic phase and this left ventricular and left atrial pressure traces during diastole. When you look at these curves, you see that there are, in fact, three different parts. The first one corresponds to the isovolumic relaxation. At that time, the LV is relaxing very strongly. And you see that it's a very uh, steep decrease in the LV pressure. It's an active phenomenon that consumes ATP, by the way. And so it makes that, it results that when the mitral valve opens, 
um, at that time, the left ventricular pressure still decreases below the right, the left atrial pressure. It means that at this early phase of diastole, there is a pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the left atrial. The second phase is the middle of diastole, and at that time, the blood um, quietly uh, flows from the left atrium to the left ventricle. And the third phase at the end of diastole corresponds to the left atrial contraction. And at this time again, as you easily understand, there is a pressure gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle. It means that at the beginning and the end of diastole, we have two pressure gradients that create a significant, of course, motion of red blood cells with a velocity that can be measured with Doppler, because Doppler measures velocities. And it explains why, if you put your Doppler sampling window in the middle of the mitral flow, you can record this E, like early, and A, like atrial waves, at Doppler. This is the reason for these very famous E and A waves. So now, how is it possible to estimate the LV preload through these E and A waves? In fact, intuitively, you understand that if the LV filling pressure is elevated, look at the uh, blue arrow, it means that this point is elevated. It means that an elevation of the LV filling pressure creates a high E wave and a high E over A ratio. Then, let's say it's very easy. Let's use the E over A ratio and a high E over A ratio to estimate an elevated LV filling pressure. But we have a problem. And the problem comes from the relaxation impairment. Again, you easily intuitively understand that if there is an impairment of the relaxation of the left ventricle, the slope of the LV pressure during relaxation is very flat. It's not as steep as normally. It means that an impairment of the relaxation of the left ventricle that makes the relaxation uh, uh, softer weaker reduces the size of the E wave. And so it means that the E wave is influenced by the LV filling pressure, but also by the relaxation of the left ventricle. And this is a great problem because of course, if a patient has both an elevating LV filling pressure and an impaired relaxation, which is by the way, quite often, then we cannot use anymore the E over A ratio to estimate an elevated LV filling pressure. We have the problem, the E wave reflects not only the LV filling pressure, but also the relaxation of the left ventricle. Then the next logical question is, uh, how is it possible to, to do with that? And in fact, the, the solution to this issue comes from the analysis of the mitral annulus. Because when you look at this, uh, at this uh, echo movie, you understand that this motion of the mitral annulus up and down is related to the LV contraction and to the LV relaxation. In other words, you understand when you look at this image that if the relaxation of the left ventricle is strong, the down, the back motion of the mitral annulus is stronger and is faster. By contrast, if the LV relaxes uh, in a softer way, in, um, in a weaker way, then the back motion of the mitral annulus will have a lower 
velocity. It means that, in fact, if we assess the velocity of the mitral annulus and of this back motion, we have an estimation of the LV relaxation. You may know that today it is possible to estimate the velocity of the mitral annulus because it's possible to use today the tissue Doppler imaging, TDI. In fact, the usual, the common Doppler is made for estimating the velocity of the red blood cells, of the blood. But if we set um, the ECH graph differently in order to measure the uh, lower velocities, then we can measure the velocities of the walls and not of the block. Tissue Doppler imaging assesses the velocities of the mitral annulus and of the mitral, uh, of the, the left ventricular walls. And especially if we focus on the mitral annulus and the inner or the external part, we can measure that velocity of the back motion of the left ventricle. We have here an E, e prime wave, which determinant is the LV relaxation. It means that at the same time of the E and A waves, we have an E prime and an A prime waves, and by the way, also an S wave, that reflects the velocity of the mitral annulus. Just to tell you, before this E prime wave was, was sometimes called the E capital letter A uh, wave. Today, by convention, we'll speak about the E prime and A prime waves. Okay. Now, how is it possible using that to estimate the LV filling pressure? It's easy to understand. As we have seen, our problem is that the E wave is determined by the LV filling pressure and the LV relaxation. But the E prime wave is determined only by LV relaxation. And so if we divide E by E prime, we have a variable, an index, which is influenced only by the LV filling pressure. By dividing E by E prime, we have an estimation of the LV filling pressure, which is not influenced anymore by the LV relaxation. It is the reason why this E over E prime ratio is the best estimate of the LV preload that we have at the bedside. That being said, we have another problem now that we have this E over E prime ratio. And the problem is that there is a very large gray zone in the limits of the E over E prime ratio that indicate elevated LV filling pressure. Below eight, it's quite sure that the LV filling pressure is not elevated. Above 15, it's quite sure that the LV and diastolic pressure is elevated. But in the middle, in this very large gray zone, we cannot say, we cannot know. And even more, this E over E prime ratio is a very rough estimate of the reference, the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, which is the, um, the, the gold standard for estimating the LV preload. Look at that uh, slide here. You see that given value of the E over EA or E over E prime, its synonym ratio, may correspond to very different PAOP values. So definitely bear that in mind, even if you can estimate it, even if it is not influenced by the LV relaxation, the E over E prime ratio has a very large gray zone. It is not a very precise assessment of the LV filling pressure. Okay. Now let's move to the second part and to the concept of uh, fluid responsiveness. Of course, unlikely, you know this concept. When we speak about fluid responsiveness, in fact, we speak about the relationship between stroke volume and cardiac output on the one side and cardiac preload. And as you know also by physiology, due to physiology, the relationship between stroke volume and cardiac preload is this one 
it's a curvilinear relationship, it's the Frank Starling relationship. In fact, when we infuse fluid to a patient, we increase the cardiac preload, and we expect that in response, stroke volume will increase. But um, the problem is that the slope of the Frank Starling curve is not constant. It mainly depends on the ventricular function, of the ventricular systolic function. It means that in a given patient, the slopes might be steep or flat. It means that a given fluid administration with the same volume could correspond to a significant or a non-significant increase in stroke volume and cardiac preload, depending on the slope of the frank Stalin curve. All patients do not respond to fluid administration. And many studies have shown that it's only 50% of the patients that do not respond to fluid administration as it was expected before giving fluid, except of course, if the uh, fluid losses, if the blood losses are obvious. And then of course, the, the, the logical question we should ask uh, after that is how could we predict fluid responsiveness? before giving fluid, and today we ask the question, how could we do that with echocardiography? The wrong way to assess fluid responsiveness has been used for many years, and it was to look just at the value of cardiac preload, at the static, the given value of cardiac preload. It's been done, for instance, with the CVP, with the E of the E prime ratio or the diameter of the IVC at expiration. But you understand just by looking at that figure that it doesn't work. Because of the different slopes of the Frank Stalin curve, a given value of a static marker of cardiac preload could correspond to a positive or a negligible response of cardiac output because it is not possible to assess that slope. And it is the main reason why it's been demonstrated by many, many, many studies in thousands of patients that a given value of CVP or a given value of the E of A prime ratio or a given value of the IVC diameter at an expiration do not predict fluid responsiveness. And the same for the LV and diastolic volume, by the way. Just to illustrate that in that study, but there are many other ones performed in, in our department years ago. Look, the LV and diastolic area on the right side, the E of the E prime ratio left side, were similar between responders and non-responders to fluid administration before giving fluid. They do not allow you to assess fluid responsiveness. So in fact, it means that it's not the right way. If we try to draw a very simple algorithm, the question is, um, in my patient, is cardiac output too low? For instance, lactate is elevated, um, uh, the urine output is low. Or... Then the next question is, are there obvious, obvious fluid losses or are we at the very early phase of sepsis? In such cases, we know that the patient will respond to fluid administration and there is no need to test to predict fluid responsiveness. But in the other cases, we must test fluid responsiveness. And as you know, many tests have been used to assess preload responsiveness. And if they are positive, we may give fluid with uh, the certitude that it will, the, the certainty that it will increase cardiac output. And um, since um, uh, 2000, in fact, uh, many ways, many indices, many tests of fluid in, uh, predicting fluid responsiveness have been developed. How is it possible to use these tests with echocardiography? This is what we are going to, to, to see now. 
First, <clears throat> regarding the fluid challenge itself, it means giving 500 milliliters or 300 milliliters fluid and looking at the response. It's very easy to perform and it's, by the way, very reliable, but there are two issues to the very common fluid challenge. The first one is that you cannot assess the effects of a fluid challenge just by looking at the blood pressure because it's a rough estimation of the response of cardiac code. You need a direct measurement of cardiac code. The second and the main drawback of the fluid challenge that perhaps you use in your ICU is that it inherently induces fluid overload. I mean that if your patient does not respond to your fluid challenge of uh, three, uh, 300 cc's, for instance, you cannot remove them from the patient. And this creates fluid outlet. This is why the mini fluid challenge is likely something interesting. The idea is to give not 300 cc's, but a small amount of fluid to assess fluid responsiveness, 100 or 150 milliliters. Today, <clears throat> an advantage of that is surely that we have more and more positive studies. But the point on which I would like to insist is that it requires a precise measurement of cardiac output. Why do I say that? Look, this is the... Um, the first study that assessed the reliability of that mini fluid challenge by a French team. And actually, the sensitivity, the specificity, the every end of the rock curve were good. But we have a problem. The best cutoff detecting fluid responsiveness was a 6%, 6% increase in cardiac output estimated by ECHO. It means a 6% increase in the velocity time integral. And this is the problem. Of course, small amounts of fluid can only induce small changes in preload that can only induce small changes in cardiac output that must be detected by echocardiography, by this velocity time integral. And I'm not sure that echocardiography is precise enough for assessing these small changes. I'm even sure that it's not the case. Because we um, recently published that study in critical care about the precision of echocardiography and look at the result. The least significant change, the smallest change that you may trust with echocardiography in VTI is 10% if it's the same operator that performs by examination. It means I do echo, I give fluid, I do the echo again. If the change is smaller than 10%, I'm not sure that it's due to a mistake, to an error in measurement. And so it means that the mini fluid challenge can barely be estimated with echocardiography you need, I think, a more precise assessment of cardiac output, especially if you are not a, um, a king in echocardiography, because then being sure that your measurement in VTI is very precise is not, uh, is not sure, is not possible. So perhaps that we may address some tests that allow us to test fluid responsiveness, but without giving one drop of fluid. The first way that has been developed is to look at the pulse pressure or stroke volume variation. In fact, it is a way, PPV and SVV, to look at the frank styling curve or the frank styling curve slope at the bedside. Indeed, you all know that in a ventilated patient, in the mechanical ventilation, positive pressure ventilation, each insufflation of the ventilator will inflate the thorax and decrease cardiac preload. It will impede the venous return from the uh, inferior and superior vena cava. It means that mechanical ventilation induces 
cyclic changes in cardiac preload, then it's very easy. If mechanical ventilation induces no change or small changes in stroke volume or in the amplitude of the arterial pulse pressure, it's very likely that your patient is fluid unresponsive. But if mechanical ventilation is associated with large changes in pulse pressure variation with a high PPV value, your patient is fluid responsive and it's the way PPV and SVV predict fluid responsiveness. You can use any estimate of stroke volume. It can be the amplitude of the arterial pressure. So if the patient has an arterial catheter, it's very easy. But if there is no arterial catheter with echocardiography, you may use the VTI or even uh, easier, the amplitude of the aortic or the LV output tract signal, the peak velocity. And some studies have uh, demonstrated that if the peak velocity is larger than 12%, it's very likely that the patient is fluid responsive, or 13%, as demonstrated by this first study in 2001. Okay, by the way, if the patient has an arterial line, it's no need to perform echo. It, 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 you just have to look at PPV. It's much easier and as reliable. It's not a problem. The problem we have, and you know that, of course, is that PPV, SVV, or the peak velocity with echocardiography cannot be used in many cases. Cardiac arrhythmias that create false positives, spontaneous breathing, even under mechanical ventilation that create false positives, a low tidal volume, if the tidal volume is too small, it's not enough to create PPV, and so it creates false negatives. And the same thing, a low lung compliance. Because if the lungs are very rigid, then the changes in alveolar pressure are not transmitted to the cardiac cavities. And PPV does not vary. It creates false negatives. It means that low lung compliance, low tidal volume, it's in ARDS patients that we have some false negatives. And definitely the problem that you know that is that it corresponds to a very large proportion of patients, especially in the IC. So keep that in mind. The respiratory changes in the LV outflow tract peak velocity is in fact an estimate of PPV, but just like PPV, it cannot be used in case of arrhythmias, spontaneous breathing, and ARTS. In such cases, we need something else. Could it be the changes in the IVC or the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava diameters? The advantage is that you don't need to measure cardiac output for the mini fluid challenge. You need to measure cardiac output, but here, no need. You just have to look at the IVC. In fact, the principle, it's not like PPV and SVV. It's not a direct estimate of the uh, frank stalling slope at the bedside because what creates changes in IVC diameter if the patient is fluid responsive? How does it work? First, the principle is that if the patient is preload responsive, during mechanical ventilation, the CVP values, the CVP value changes with ventilation. It means that CVP, the intramural pressure of the IVC, changes with ventilation. And secondly, if the patient is hypovolemic, the IVC is empty and so it is more compliant, and so it is more sensitive to the changes in intra-abdominal pressure. It is crushed easier at each respiratory cycle. These both factors likely explain why the IVC changes in case of preload responsiveness. Why do I show that? It is to, to show you that 
In fact, it is not um, a direct estimation of the frank Stalin curve. It's not the same. For instance, you easily understand that the intra-abdominal pressure plays a, an important role in the IBC changes. And uh, studies have shown that it is possible, anyway, to use IBC changes or SVC changes in that study by Antoine Pierre Baron to assess preload responsiveness. Okay. Which, by the way, requires transverse optical echocardiography. But nevertheless, the main drawback of the IBC and SBC changes is that, again, they cannot be used in many instances. Spontaneous breathing, because the same it creates changes in IBC that are not due to preload responsiveness, but also in case of low lung compliance, low tidal volume, the same. Yes, there is no problem with cardiac arrhythmias. IBC changes, SVC changes remain valid in case of cardiac arrhythmias, which is in that way better than PP. But we have the problem of intra-abdominal hypertension. In all these instances, it is not possible to use IBC changes to assess fluid responsiveness. I insist on that because it's very often to see in the ICU, in the emergency department, some colleagues that put echo to know whether IVC changes in a patient without ventilation to assess preload responsiveness. This is senseless. And this likely leads to this second drawback, which is that IVC, SVC changes are less reliable to assess preload responsiveness. First, we have this study, the one I quoted before, this French study in 540 patients. Look. Prediction of preload responsiveness with IVC and SVC changes, low area, small area under the rack curve. The area under the rack curve for the IVC was only 0.65, which is very bad, much lower than PPV, for instance. This is a disappointing study. Second, we today have several meta analyses showing that IVC especially, but also SVC changes do not predict responsiveness that well. For instance, this one we published with some uh, Indian colleagues. Look at the area under the rack curve again, not good, not enough. Many disappointing meta analysis. <clears throat> this study uh, I showed before is also interesting because the IVC diameter not only is a poor marker of CVP as I showed you, but also it does not predict fluid responsiveness. It's a static marker of preload, except for extreme values that are very uncommon. And even more, the detection of fluid responsiveness is even worse in case of intra-abdominal hypertension. I think it's a very important message. The variation in the IVC diameter is not very reliable to assess preload responsiveness. It's the same for SVC changes. And in addition, for the IVC variation, it is uh, worse in case of intra-abdominal hypertension. Okay. We cannot speak about the recruitment maneuvers. There is no study with echocardiography. And so we move to the respiratory occlusion test. What is that? In fact, it is a way to test fluid responsiveness, which um, also uses heart-lung interactions, just like PPV, as we have seen. It's very easy to understand, you'll see. During mechanical ventilation, each insufflation tends to impede venous return. Venous return tends to increase during expiration, but it is stopped by the next inspiration. And so, if we stop mechanical ventilation at end expiration, just for a few seconds, just like when you measure the intrinsic PEEP, you allow the cardiac preload to increase for a few seconds. And if you wait a long time enough to allow that preload bolus to cross the pulmonary circulation, the left ventricular preload increases as well. And so, if in response to an end experience,
with anti-expiratory occlusion, you can observe um, in, in, in cardiac index, you see, the cardiac index increases during the 15 second anti-expiratory occlusion. And the diagnostic threshold is a 5% increase. So very easy with pulse counter analysis. Today, 12 studies have been performed with that anti-expiratory occlusion test. This is a meta-analysis we are preparing for the moment. By the way, you see the, the amplitude of the area under the rock curve, 0.96, much higher than for the IEVC changes. Now, is it possible to assess that with echocardiography? Because it's uh, our question today. This study of um, a French team of Mathieu Biev showed that if you assess the end-expert occlusion test by looking at the VTI changes, the test is reliable, good area under the rock curve, and a small grazing. But the problem you have is that the threshold of VTI changes is small, small regarding to the precision of echocardiography. This is why in that study that in fact we performed, we had performed before, we, we did some end expiratory holds of ventilation and we expected an increase, a de, an increase during expiration in VTI that whispers, but also an end inspiratory hold during 15 seconds that was supposed to induce larger changes in stroke volume in response on the opposite. So we expected just in a few words, that if we added the changes in VTI induced by an expiratory hold of 15 seconds and induced by a subsequent and inspiratory hold of 15 seconds, the sum of these changes was going to be larger than in fluid non-responders, in fluid responders. The results are on this slide. <clears throat> if we looked only at the changes in VTI induced by and expiratory holds of 15 seconds. We had a good area under the record, but the threshold was very small, 4% increase in VTI, much too small compared to the precision of echocardiography. By contrast, if we looked at the changes, at the sum of the changes induced by an expiratory hold and inspiratory hold together, we had an area under the rock curve that was much more compatible with the precision of echocardiography. With echocardiography, the end expiratory occlusion test should be associated with an inspiratory hold in order to overcome its relative lack of precision. So you can assess the EEO test with echo, but it is less easy than with pulse counter analysis or any other continuous measurement of cardiac output because you, can, you must induce expiratory holds and inspiratory holds. Of course, it's not possible to use that if you cannot um, interrupt ventilation for 15 seconds in a patient, and it happens in some patients who are not uh, sedated, of course. Finally, let's move to the passive leg raising test. I'm sure that you heard about this test that, in fact, is a pseudo-fluid uh, challenge. It's not a fluid challenge. It's a preload challenge with blood that you transfer from the legs, but also from the very large planknic compartment to other cardiac cavities. Okay, this is the principle of passive leg raising. The first point regarding passive leg raising, it is a very reliable way to assess preload responsiveness. From the first study we published in 2006, many studies have been published concerning in meta-analysis the good results and from um, since uh, 2000, I think 16, when we published this meta-analysis, many other studies have confirmed our results good sensitivity, good specificity. 
And this high level of evidence is likely the reason why the passive leg raising test has been included in the recommendations of the surviving sepsis campaign that recommends to assess fluid responsiveness dynamically, not with the CVP anymore, by using the fluid challenge, which we have seen the drawbacks, or the passive leg raise. Okay, so it's well demonstrated. Another advantage is that it's possible to use that in patients with spontaneous breathing, ARDS, cardiac arrhythmias, all the situations where the IVC changes or PPV cannot be used. But there are two main drawbacks to passive leg raising, and we will finish with that. The first one is that to assess the effects of PLR, you must have a direct estimation of cardiac output. You cannot rely on only the changes of blood pressure on the bedside monitor. You need something that measures cardiac output. So which device? You can use pulse control analysis, but all the patients are not equipped with such devices. You can use a soft gel Doppler in the operating room. You can use anti CO2 if the patient has stable ventilation. You can use platysmography, you can use bioreactants, and you can use, of course, echocardiography. With echo, during passive leg raising, you will look at changes in cardiac output. But in fact, since the changes in velocity time integral are proportional to the changes in cardiac output, you just have to look at the changes in VTI. If VTI increases by more than 10%, the passive leg raising test is positive. Okay. It's not <clears throat> very convenient. You must perform echo in the summer recumbent position and repeat the examination when the patient is the, is in the leg raised position. But it's a non-invasive way and quite a reliable way to assess passive leg raising. And the threshold is more a 10% threshold. The second drawback and this is quite new data, is that the PLR test is likely not valid in case of intra-abdominal hypertension. Which was the next slide, I'm sorry. The PLR test can be assessed through the changes in VTI, which are proportional to changes in cardiac output. So, I don't uh, show you the reasons why, but, um, in case of intra-abdominal hypertension, be careful because there are some false negatives. My time is off and so I stop here and I thank you very much for your uh, attention and I'm ready, I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Javier. It was, it was an amazing presentation. Thank you for this time. Thank, thank you for giving us, for giving us this amazing moment. Thank you so much. Let's move to the questions and comments. Dr. Xavier, if you allow me, in Spanish. <laughs> sure, but you will translate, ¿no? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bueno, pues, <clears throat> como ustedes vieron, eh, esto realmente es increíble. Le agradecemos mucho, mucho al doctor Javier eh, Mané por este extraordinario momento que nos ha regalado de, de aprendizaje una fabulosa revisión de todo lo que, lo que se ha publicado sobre la predicción de respuesta a volumen a través del ultrasonido cardíaco. Bueno, pues si tienen ustedes alguna pregunta, uh, algo que, que comentar, desde luego que estamos en este momento dispuestos a hacerle las preguntas al doctor Xavier Moné, pero antes, este, Quetzalcóatl, no sé si tú quisieras hacer algún comentario, yo también tengo algunas preguntas para el doctor. Adelante, Juan, si quieres iniciar tú. Y... Sí, bueno, eh, yo lo que quiero comentarle a, al doctor eh, Xavier es acerca del estudio FENIS, que el cual nos demostró algunas cosas que no sé cómo llamarle, pues muy interesantes respecto, a, es, una, es un sorbe y es una, es, una, es una encuesta a muchos médicos eh, sobre el uso de, la, eh, de los retos de líquidos y cómo ellos evalúan la respuesta a volumen y nos dio algunos aspectos interesantes este estudio que me gustaría comentarlos con el doctor Xavier. Eh, doctor Xavier, eh, I would like to hear from you your opinion about the Fenice study, because apparently in this study was well demonstrated that not all the physicians 
uh, use dynamic variables despite all of the literature and despite all the the, the papers and and all the consensus and uh, despite uh, dynamic variables are well demonstrated that they are more useful in order to predict flu responsiveness only a uh, half of, of the physicians uh, currently use uh, dynamic vari variables. What's your opinion about that, doctor? Um, uh, it is demonstrated, actually. First of all, it's, um, it's surprising because, as you said, the demonstration, first, that not all the patients respond to fluid, and second, that static markers of preload do not predict fluid responsiveness, the level of the evidence is extremely high. So it's, uh, it's surprising and it's sad, by the way. Now, that being said, why? Perhaps because we did not um, teach the clinicians enough. Perhaps also because uh, they are a bit reluctant to use these tests and perhaps because they did not understand what's behind these tests and you know as doctors we don't like to use what we do not understand for instance PPV or IBC changes mm -hmm. and third the other reason is perhaps because um, our colleagues find that it is not very easy to perform and for instance passive leg raising which is very reliable one must say that it's a bit cumbersome to perform it's easier to give fluid and, and, and that's all. So our task is to teach people, to explain them, but also perhaps to find some tests that are easier to use than the ones we have developed before. Yes, yes, doctor. And actually uh, something that is very interesting also is that uh, sometimes the physician is aware that the patient is not responder. And whatever the, the means or the, the, whatever the method they are using, they are aware that the patient is not responder. And despite they are aware of that, they decide to give fluid. This is something very, very interesting. And at the conclusion of the story is that we need more education. <laughs> and that's why we are, we are doing all of yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's your opinion about it, doctor? No, it's incredible. It means that uh, it's the same as if uh, these patients, these uh, clinicians, perhaps they are patients in a way, um, had the um, antibiogram of a, bacter, of, uh, of a germ, they know that it is resistance, it is resistance to penicillin, but they give penicillin. It's exactly the same. Mm. I think that in that way, I choose this example because it shows that perhaps that the people are not convinced about the risk of excessive fluid administration. I, I don't know why they give fluid in spite of fluid and responsiveness, but I think that in their mind it is not that it is not that important. It doesn't matter that well that much. And they are wrong because the risk of fluid overload is clearly demonstrated today. Exactly. Thank you so much. Quetzalcoatl, no sé si tuvieras algún otro comentario mientras reviso las preguntas de la audiencia. Sí, gracias, Juan. Doctor, there is a recent uh, publication that states that probably the use of uh, dynamic predictors of fluid responsiveness could delay the attention of the patient in the emergency department and probably that uh, can depart in a increase on mortality of the patient with sepsis. What is your opinion about that? Do you believe that the use of these <coughs> tools could delay the, the, the interventions, particularly the administration of fluids or even the administration of vasopressors in patients who doesn't respond to, to fluid therapy? You mean the question is why? Can you re repeat the question itself yeah. again? The, the question is, if you believe that the use of, of uh, the fluid responsiveness strategies or, or monitoring mm -hmm. could delay the attention of the patient and could delay the administration of fluids or even the vasopressors. Okay, thank you. It's a very important question. I think, uh, I don't know if it's possible, but uh, it should not, of course. In, that, uh, in, that, uh, in this slide, 
there is a very important message and I try to insist a bit in my presentation on that. There are some patients where predicting fluid responsiveness is useless. For instance, a patient with a hemorrhagic shock, it would be totally, uh, it would be totally senseless to test fluid responsiveness. Of course, at the initial phase, the patient is fluid responsive. A patient with a ketoacidosis and hypertension, of course, he or she is preload responsive. And the same also during the very early phase of sepsis. At the early phase, during the first, uh, uh, very first steps of sepsis, there is relative hypovolemia. Of course, the patient is fluid responsive. In this patient, we should not test fluid responsiveness. And we should not... Uh, uh, because definitely it was, it was, it was, uh, this time should be used to give fluid, not to test fluid responsiveness. That's the point. And so in that way, perhaps that in these cases, a wrong, a bad uh, strategy may delay the administration of fluids. It remains that, in my opinion, the main risk is not to delay fluid administration in these patients. It is to give too much fluid without assessing fluid responsiveness. Because after this initial phase, even in hemorrhagic shock, but once hypovolemia has been corrected, in septic shock, after one liter of fluid, then the patient has a higher risk not to respond to fluid administration. And this is, I think, the main risk. Yes. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. And I have another question. Usually, the intensivist face to a problem, uh, particularly in resuscitated sepsis, you can have two or three uh, uh, ways to monitor the patient, and, and you face to the problem that uh, PPV or passive leg raising is negative, but you have another test that is positive. So what would you consider to do in that situation? Do you usually use two or three methods to evaluate preload responsiveness or usually limit to one or two with the best uh, uh, area under the, the, the curve? It's a very um, important and practical question. Actually, we don't have all the day in given patients to assess fluid responsiveness. Unfortunately, we have many patients to take uh, care of and so it's not possible. Let's be practical. I think that one test is enough. Not in the cases, perhaps, when the changes in cardiac output are close to the threshold. For instance, passive leg raising increases cardiac output, but by only 9%, 12%. And if I consider that the risk of fluid administration in this patient is high, for instance, the patient is, is, uh, has severe ARDS. I really don't want to give fluid if he or she is not fluid responsive. Then it is interesting to use another test to assess the fluid responsiveness. You know, in fact, uh, in my department, the, uh, my colleagues use mainly the end expiratory occlusion test because it's easier to perform than the passive leg raise, definitely. But I tell them, if the EEO test is positive but not very positive, then perform passive leg raising, even if it is more uh, cumbersome and less practical. Otherwise, if the test is very positive or very negative, just use one only test. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Shahir. And my final question, uh, Juan. Si, si, si. Uh, there's another problem that we usually face in the ICU, and it's the patient who is on um, prone position ventilation. And we all understand that prone position probably uh, can induce some change in hemodynamics. So what would you advise to us, or, or what is the best method to, to predict the responsiveness in the patient who is in Proposition ventilation without uh, right ventricular failure because I understand that <laughs> probably that's another, yeah, another it's another issue. issue and as you know uh, prone positioning may solve the right ventricular failure at least it, it helps the right ventricle a lot but it's not a question you're right thank you for the question because it's a very practical question 
leg. Of course, passive leg raising is not uh, is not the suitable test. There has been one French study, but only one, as far as I know, showing that in prone positioning, the Twendelenburg position might be interesting because it's the same. You transfer blood from the lower part of the body to the um, to the heart. It's only one study. It's an equivalent of passive leg raising in prone position. I'm a bit scared about the fact that it may induce some um, regurgitation, you know, and especially if the stomach is not empty, because uh, it's not like passive leg raising. The head is really down in the Trendelenburg position. But anyway, this might be a solution. Or the one that we use every day in my unit is the end expiratory occlusion test. Of course, with echocardiography, it's not very easy to perform. Let's say with echo, there is no way to test fluid responsiveness uh, on prone positioning. Perhaps with a transesophageal uh, echocardiography, which is possible in prone position, I can say that it's uh, really not easy to perform. Then my very practical advice would be use the end expiratory occlusion test if you can, if you have a way to measure cardiac output. Otherwise, wait that the patient is turned on the other side okay thank you and in the time you can increase norepinephrine i don't know but if you want really not to give fluid wait a bit yes okay thank you so much dr xavier uh, we have some questions from the audience uh, quetzal uh, mientras uh, no sé si mientras eh, le pregunto algunas del, del auditorio quisieras checar en facebook también por ahí hay algunas preguntas quetzal sí. Okay, uh, Dr. Xavier, uh, someone is uh, yes, uh, someone is questioning about the possibility to evaluate fluid responsiveness with carotid flow because sometimes uh, our physicians don't have a transthoracic echo, and the only method that they have is the carotid uh, Doppler. Dr. Xavier, what is your opinion about Doppler flow? Very important question. I think that you uh, is that you refer to carotid blood flow during passive leg raising because there have been some studies showing that if during PLR the carotid blood flow increases, the test is positive. Yes. Also, there are even studies with femoral blood flow. Mm -hmm. There are some positive studies, but I would be um, I would be cautious because in our hands it doesn't work at all. And we have one paper in uh, Annals of Intensive Care uh, two or three years ago now, and it didn't work, but really at all. I don't know why it worked uh, in other hands and not in our hands, but at least I think that um, we should be cautious with that or wait for something more uh, reliable. Um, obviously, carotid blood flow is not cardiac output. You know, there is something... Uh, between both and it's a surrogate yeah. it's a surrogate but a rough surrogate then you know a carotid blood flow is sure it's quite easy to assess with echocardiography but assessing the vti is not much much more complicated you know and the solution i think is to teach people how to assess the vti it's not very difficult again rather than uh, looking at the carotid of femoral blood flow. Yes, thank you, doctor. And uh, someone is questioning, Dr. Xavier, about the uh, evaluation of flu responsiveness in patients with a low tidal volume. I think you are uh, written uh, some articles about that, and there are some papers about uh, how to adjust the, the, the threshold in this case of patients. Could you please comment uh, briefly some aspects about the uh, about patients with low tidal volume when we are evaluating, for instance, uh, uh, pulse pressure variation, doctor? It's an excellent question because it's uh, today a large proportion of our ICU patients that have a low VT in my, my unit and likely in yours, even patients without KIS are ventilated with low tidal volumes. First point. You can't use PPV and the usual threshold in this patient. Mm -hmm. Second point, 
there is one way perhaps that you may use, which is called the Tidal Volume Challenge. It's a, an article that we published with an Indian colleague, Dr. Mayatra, uh, two years ago, and it's been confirmed by some studies. The principle of the test is very easy. Your patient is ventilated at six meters per kilogram. You measure PPV with the, false, the risk of false negatives. You increase VT to eight for a few minutes, and you, you measure PPV again. And if PPV at eight minus PPV at six is larger than 3.5 in absolute value, it's likely your patient is fluid responsive. It means if increasing the VT increases PPV in a significant way, it's likely the patient is fluid responsive. So it's a way to, um, to circumvent the issue of low tidal volume. Third, in case of low tidal volume, you can still use the end expiratory plume test, which works likely, and the passive leg raising. Nevertheless, and finally, there have been two studies suggesting that the end expiratory occlusion test is more valid at eight than at six milliliters of mercury of a, per kilogram. We did not find that uh, in, in, in our studies, but since some studies suggested that, uh, uh, perhaps we should be a bit cautious before further confirmation about the EEO. So either the tidal volume challenge or passive leg raising or perhaps the EEO test with that possible limitation. Exactly. Thank you so much, doctor. And one more question, doctor, if you allow me. Um, we talked about the inferior cava vein and all the drawbacks and pitfalls that it has. And do you consider the jugular vein has the same or, or applies the, the same aspects or the same limitations than the inferior cava vein uh, with the jugular vein? Again, um, again, there are some studies I know. First, the IVC or SVC variations, as we have seen, it's likely not very reliable, so it cannot be better with the superior vena cava. But again, if people can assess the internal jugular vein diameter changes, I'm pretty sure that they're able to measure the VTI during passive leg raising. So, and I even think that some, sometimes it's much easier. But regarding the reliability in any way, I'm quite suspicious about that. I know there are some positive studies, but at least it should be confirmed. Yes, thank you, doctor. And the last question from the audience is, uh, what's your opinion about the evaluation of volume responsiveness in patients with uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? Uh, in your opinion, there is a specific method, or what's your opinion about these kind of patients, doctor? Very, very difficult issue, actually. Um, first, we lack studies. And secondly, there are many tests that are obviously uh, limited. Um, these patients have usually a very low tidal volume, so you may forget all what is PPV. The EEO test is likely also a problem. Passive leg raising is not very easy in these patients with cannulas, but perhaps it may be, it may be used. And I think that it is likely a situation where a mini fluid challenge might be interesting, provided that you can measure cardiac output reliably, which is possible with echocardiography. But in that case, again, uh, be careful to have very precise measurements of VTI. Uh, do the measurement exactly at the same place. Perhaps mm -hmm. don't move the probe when you you infuse fluid to be sure that you measure exactly the same VTI because again, as I said, the issue of the mini fluid challenge is the precision of your measurement. So to be clear, I would do passive leg raising if possible and mini fluid challenge otherwise, just with checking with improving at best the precision of my measurements. Exactly. Thank you, doctor. Eh, Ketza, no sé si eh, tuvieras algunos comentarios de nuestra audiencia. Sí, hay, hay una pregunta. 
pregunta desde Facebook. Uh, es una difícil. Doctor Morning, we have a difficult one from Facebook. This is from uh, Jose Manuel Vasquez, and it's a pretty specific condition. And he asked about uh, which will be the best uh, food responsive predictor in patients under uh, pneumoperitoneum induced by laparoscopic surgery. I mean, those patients are in the OR, they have a, a, a CO2 in the abdomen and simulates a, a condition of uh, intraabdominal pressure or hypertension. And also, they are in trentalambular position. So he's asking, what would you consider to use as a food predictor in those patients? Thank you, Jose Manuel, for your uh, question. <laughs> uh, muchas gracias, first. <laughs> Second, so passive leg raising, forget PPV, SVV, like you're not very good. Um, so I think it would be with the end expiratory occlusion test. Um, especially today in the OR, there are many ventilators uh, that allow you performing stopping ventilation at an expiration, just like when you measure the intrinsic P. It was not possible in the old ventilators in the OR, but I think that today many of them do. I'm not an anesthesiologist, but this is what uh, my uh, anesthesiologist uh, colleagues told me. So this is the test I would use, EEO. Finally, again, you know, if, if your patient has not ARDS, if the risk of fluid infusions is not that high, perhaps that a mini fluid challenge or even a common a standard fluid challenge might be useful. One must say that if your patient has normal lung, then a fluid challenge is perhaps a good way when you, have, when you can't use any other test because the risk of fluid infusion and of fluid overload is obviously less. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xavier. And uh, one pediatrician, doctor, if you allow me, I don't know if you have time, maybe this is the, the, the last question, doctor. And I, pre I appreciate your, your time with us. Um, one pediatrician is questioning about the best methods in pediatric population. I mean, uh, does it change the, the method or what, what's your opinion about a pediatric population? How to evaluate uh, volume responsiveness in this specific population? First point, very few studies like uh, usually in children. Second point, what's clearly demonstrated is that there are, there are some false positives with PPV and SVV and all the respiratory changes. So these are not the tests I would use. Third, there are some studies with passive leg raising, but then in this case, I think that the age of the patients might be important. You can easily understand that depending on the size and so the end, the age of the, uh, of the child, the volume of blood transferred with PLR is not the same. And fourth, uh, as far as I know, there is no study with the end expiratory occlusion test. Okay. So it means that there are studies to, to perform, by the way. If you want to perform some studies in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in children, I can give you many ideas because the literature about that is very, very poor. Ok, thank you, doctor. Bueno, pues no sé, Ketza, si hubiera un último comentario, alguna otra pregunta para ya cerrar nuestro webinario, Ketza. No, Juan, o a Facebook ya no tiene más preguntas. Parece ser que a través aquí de la plataforma de Zoom uh, tampoco. Esto, están agotados ahí ya los, los temas considerados. Los Así es. Bueno, pues entonces vamos, sí, sí, sí. vamos a, a terminar ya con nuestro webinario, agradecerles a todos nuestros amigos desde toda Latinoamérica, principalmente en Bolivia, en Ecuador, en Paraguay, Argentina, tenemos amigos en Uruguay, en Chile, que nos están visualizando en estos momentos, les agradecemos mucho su presencia, hemos roto el, el récord de audiencia, verdaderamente tuvimos hoy mucha participación en nuestra plataforma, les recordamos que esta, esta conferencia fue avalada por el Consejo Mexicano de Medicina Crítica y van a tener a los que se registraron por medio de la plataforma 
van a tener eh, en su correo una, una constancia con valor curricular. Así que, bueno, pues les agradecemos mucho a todos nos hayan acompañado. Te agradezco mucho a ti, Quetzalcóatl, y por supuesto al doctor Xavier Mané por habernos acompañado. Es para nosotros como asociación, como grupo, un verdadero honor haberlo tenido y haber compartido este espacio con él, puesto como, puesto como sabemos, él es eh, una autoridad mundial en este tema. Así que, bueno, pues nos sentimos muy orgullosos. Thank you so much, Dr. Xavier Mané. We are proud for having you in this space, in this initiative. Really, really appreciate your willingness, all your participation. So your participation and, and your extraordinary presentation, doctor. I don't know if you have some last uh, words for our Latin American audience, Dr. Xavier. No, the first is that I was uh, very honored to, to be invited. So thank you very much and uh, muchas gracias, uh, uh, Juan Antonio and Quetzal, and uh, buen día a todos. Gracias, doctor. Bueno, pues terminamos. Thank you, thank you so much. And, y bueno, pues terminamos. Gracias a todos. Un abrazo grande. Thank you so much, Dr. Xavier. I'm going to finish the webinar. Thank you so much. Au revoir, a bientôt. Thank you. Bye, bye.